Well, good morning, everybody. Um, can I uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and any elders who are with us here today. Elders of, of this community and elders of other communities. Um, I bring the most sincere apologies from Natasha. If you follow her on Twitter, you'll know that she's just advised that uh, she had confirmed last night DVT, so she's been banned from flying for a period of time. We're sure it's, it's passing, but this is the first time, and I've worked with her for two and a half years now, that uh, she's been unable to be at an event. And this is um, a particularly important event to her because we value very much the partnership with Vic Health and we value particularly the journey in Victoria over several decades that has made a national conversation about prevention possible. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also uh, the Vic Health Chair and board members, Gerald Rector, CEO. Um, I want to acknowledge each of you in the room. Many of you have worked for decades uh, to enable women to be safe, to enable women and children to move down a positive and, and constructive pathway to a new life. Um, you have been advocates for change. And in what a week to hold the conference with the Royal Commission commencing as well, signs that significant change is possible in this country and is possible in this state. There will also be people in this room who are themselves survivors. And we want to acknowledge your courage and uh, that it is your advocacy um, and that it is your willingness to share with friends and family and sometimes with the broader community your story that enables the reality of men's violence against women to become uh, part of formal public policy and part of a broad movement for change in this country. Um, I'm going to read Natasha's speech. I hope to read it with some enthusiasm and passion because what she says is what I believe. Um, but she can draw on much more interesting anecdotes, some of which won't immediately apply to me, as you'll hear an analogy she uses. Um, but uh, um, I, I want to make the points today that she wanted made. So this conference, of course, coincides with the start of the Royal Commission into Family Violence, a unique opportunity to illustrate the potential of primary prevention, amongst other things. Yesterday, Commission Chair Marcia Neve told the hearing that family violence was embedded in our culture and changes would not happen overnight. She hoped that the Royal Commission would be a turning point in the battle against the scourge of family violence, as do we all. I commend Vic Health for this landmark conference and for the invitation to address the conference on the theme, Getting Serious About Change. Many of you, as I have acknowledged, have been in the business of change for a long time. In my various roles as an advocate, board member, legislator and others, I have never underestimated the long-term generational nature of social change. I also knew that with the stroke of a pen, legislation can change the lives, the lives of many for the better. I refer to some of my attempts at legislative change and this is the moment I referred to before, going off script slightly, as Pantene moments. You know, the old shampoo commercial <laughs> regarding and regaining glossy hair. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. So whether it was Australia's first same-sex marriage bill, whether it was paid parental leave legislation, or even genetic privacy, it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen. The role of our watch includes enabling local organisations, networks and communities to affect real community level change. We are charged with providing national leadership to stop violence against women and children. We want to motivate the Australian community to recognise and to reject this violence. We know that prevention is key to addressing the causes of violence and the good news, the good news is that violence is preventable. There is no way of getting away from the fact that the biggest risk factor for becoming a victim of sexual assault, domestic or family violence in Australia today is being a woman. 
Women usually experience violence and abuse at the hands of men they know, often in their own homes, often repeatedly, sometimes over many years, if not a lifetime. We know, we know this violence by many names and in many forms. Family and domestic violence, intimate partner violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, dating violence, unwanted kissing and sexual touching, rape, sex trafficking, homophobia, threats against children and femicide. No matter how this violence manifests, it is well recognised that one effect of this behaviour is to control through fear and to place the safety and wellbeing of women and children at risk. Public discussion has grown, but so have the disclosures and so have the deaths. The murder of women and their children, especially in the context of family and domestic violence, is often the final result of a long history of abuse. And as of today, we know the number of women killed in Australia is reported as being 48 this year. So this is on top of what we call the big statistics that you would be very familiar with in this room. We know that one in three women experience physical violence, one in five sexual violence, and one in six has experienced violence, physical or sexual, from a current or former partner. The World Health Organisation describes this as an epidemic and I've described it in our country as a national emergency. <clears throat> Indeed, 27% of Australian women have reported, experience physical, reported experiencing physical and or sexual intimate partner violence over their lifetime. This compares with other OECD countries such as Mozambique at 40%, Germany at 25 Denmark at 22%, and Poland at 16 and the Philippines and Switzerland both at 10%. Now we need to be careful with these statistics because reporting rates, even in anonymous surveys, will depend on how comfortable women feel in naming violence and the extent to which they see it as a problem. But the extent of variation from country to country, from community to community, shows that violence is not a constant. Different community, cultural, political and economic constructs can either condone or reduce violence against women. And one of the key understandings about reducing violence against women is that we need a focus on primary prevention, the prevention of violence in the first place. This means stopping it before it starts. It means going upstream of the problem to deal with its causes. It means changing the conditions which make it more likely to happen. It means over the long term that we can bring an end to the murder, maiming and the undermining of women. This has been understood by governments because it's set out uh, in the COAG National Plan to reduce violence against women and their children, that 12-year plan, 2010 to 2022. The National Plan is a signal from all Australian governments that making a significant and sustained reduction in violence against women and their children needs focused policy effort. The formation of the COAG advisory panel earlier this year shows how governments from across the country are prioritising this wicked problem and wanting to find more solutions. Understanding what causes violence against women helps us to understand what primary prevention looks like and what it can achieve. Internationally, there is a clear consensus. There are two key drivers of violence against women. One is gender inequality, and the other is the support for gender stereotypes. The roots of violence against women lie in persistent discrimination against women. Again, you can hear Natasha's voice in what's being said. From my overseas work as Australia's ambassador for women and girls, I know no one country has got it right when it comes to gender equality. But I worry about an Australia on a range of fronts. I worry about that Australian women fare worse than Australian men in many domains. Women are paid less for the same work with the pay gap of more than 18%. Women are more likely to engage in part-time and casual work and carry the primary responsibility for caregiving for both children and parents and retire most often with much less superannuation. 
and a new OECD report shows a worsening gap between men and women in ministerial positions in Australia. Australia now has fewer women in its highest ranks of government than every OECD country except Greece, Korea, Turkey, Turkey Hungary and Slovakia. When lack of access to resources and power defeats our efforts to achieve gender equality, then violence against women is a key symptom and the nastiest result. Research shows that there are other factors which can contribute to violence against women. That is, childhood experience of violence, alcohol abuse, socioeconomic disadvantage, to name three. But none of these are the cause. The important thing to understand is that these factors contribute to violence against women only when they come into play with the key drivers, gender inequality and gender stereotypes. So preventing violence against women, what is it? One of the reasons we're here today is the groundbreaking work in Victoria in primary prevention. One of the key mi milestones in this regard was VicHealth's Preventing Violence Before It Occurs often known as the, the Victorian Primary Prevention Framework, released in 2007. It is important to reflect on the time frame because prevention work by its nature takes a long, long time. It takes time to develop understanding, to generate evidence, to build support, to garner political will, and it takes time to ensure that the evidence and policy commitments are backed by solid investments. Think of how long it has taken to achieve significant reductions in smoking and road trauma in this country. It's been decades. But on smoking rates, this country has been world leading. So we have the same opportunity when it comes to preventing violence against women. Based on a public health approach, Vic Health proposed the sites for prevention are the settings and circumstances where we learn, work, play and socialise. This means education and early learning, workplaces, sport and recreation, the media and popular culture are all important domains for, preven for prevention policy and programming. Another principle of primary prevention is that it must work with the systems and services that support the safety and the recovery of women and children and that hold perpetrators accountable. Violence against women, the services uh, and supports that attend to this critical issue, the police and the justice services, including legal representation, need to be robust and reliable. The specialists, practitioners and first responders encountering victims need to know why violence against women happens, the drivers as well as the dynamics and the impacts on women, children and families. They need to have critical understanding so as not to buy into the many myths and misconceptions that still abound and which can blame victims and excuse abusers. Since the VicHealth framework, prevention practice has bloomed in this state. Seeds have been sown across the country. Examples include respectful relationships programs in schools and other learning environments, workplace programs, community awareness activity and grassroots campaigning. It has been a period of piloting and trialling new ideas, of gathering information, data, and sh sharpening our understanding and practice. But where to now? So we are delighted as an organisation to be working closely with VicHealth and ANROSE to develop a dedicated framework for the prevention of violence against women, a dedicated and national framework. No country in the world has a national evidence-based roadmap to prevent violence against women and their children in a coordinated way. The national framework will provide this. It will bring together international research and nationwide experience in Australia in all of its different expressions that work to prevent violence. It will establish a shared understanding of the evidence and principles of effective prevention and present a way forward for a coordinated national approach. It will provide guidance for policy and program development at local, state and national government levels. And its development is based on the understanding that much has been happening in the, in the name of prevention across the country. So we, I don't want to pretend in any way that your work in this space previously and the work of many organisations of the co across the country is not recognised in this new national framework. 
Governments, NGOs, researchers and practitioners have been working to change the conditions that perpetuate violence against women. Much of this work happens on a small scale or in isolation from other projects. But a problem of the scale that we are talking about, about one in six women who experience violence by a current or former partner, cannot be prevented or addressed project by project. Coordination and collaboration and scale are fundamental to our success. We are proud that the National Framework is the first of its kind in the world. And for policy and decision makers, we need to say the framework is a pathway. It will not prescribe the specific actions. It recognises that you are best placed to understand the particular needs of your stakeholders and your communities and the appropriate channels for action in your work areas. It will provide you with the latest evidence on what, on what makes prevention activities effective and guidance to assist, to assist policy and program development um, based on your context, your starting point and your priorities. And it'll do this in a way that links your work to that of others, not only in Victoria, but across the country. So that we hope that we are all pulling in the same direction. And we look forward to the release of the framework later this year. At the same time, our watch is working on a number of initiatives to keep primary prevention moving forward. A number of these are in Victoria and funded by the Victorian Government, where, where we are piloting primary prevention projects in schools, hospitals and culturally and linguistically diverse communities. The results of these projects will be transferable and available publicly as learnings and resources from 2016. We're also working in workplaces to increase knowledge about different types of violence, to embed gender equality in policies, practices and culture, and to encourage bystander action against sexism and discrimination. And this is based on the successful work of, again, VicHealth and the City of Melbourne. And it sits under our program named the Capital City Lighthouse Program that gives us the opportunity to work with other capital city local councils across the nation. Nationally, a key audience for us is young people, young people aged 12 to 20 years of age. We engage with this group in, our, in respectful relationships, gender equality and violence against women through our social marketing campaign, The Line. But the media also have a critical role to play. Um, and this is widely established and understood increasingly. And again, in Victoria, uh, the work of Domestic Violence Victoria and many partners in establishing the EVAs, the Eliminating Violence Against Women Media Awards, has been groundbreaking. And we have been pleased to work with DV Vic and draw on their knowledge and experience in, in the development of the Our Watch Awards, national awards that seek to celebrate constructive and, and best practice and positive reporting by the media of the issue of men's violence against women. The awards will reward and recognise excellence in journalism that contributes to a deeper understanding of violence against women, its causes and prevention. To inform this work, we are pleased to announce that we have partnered with ANROSE to commission a media representations of violence research report due for release next year. The research builds on earlier work, again pioneered by VicHealth, and it will take a national snapshot of how violence against women and their children is reported across Australia and its consequences. I acknowledge those journalists in the room and acknowledge that um, the increasingly good work that is um, promoted and shared through many media and how serious many journalists and media outlets are becoming about the opportunities and the importance and the need for change. But I must also acknowledge that the extent and depth of change required to end violence against women is daunting. To evidence this point, I want to draw your attention to our watch submissions to the Victorian Royal Commission. I would note first the joint statement with the CASA Forum, DV Vic, the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health, No to Violence, the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, Women with Disabilities Victoria, Women's Health Victoria and the Women's Health Association of Victoria regarding the 10 building blocks necessary for effective primary prevention in this state. 
we need not three nor five or seven of those building blocks in place. If we really want to affect the change that we all aspire to, we need all 10 in place. I note also, given the scale and depth of change needed to end violence against women, our watchers call to establish a safety and equality commission, a statutory body to ensure statewide reach of prevention activity and to monitor progress across the service system and at each level of intervention and response. Such a commission would also need to collaborate with efforts that trans transcend state boundaries and that are part of a national approach, such as working with media and other national institutions. Again, the extent and depth of change required to end men's violence against women is daunting. Yet I have seen the will for change take hold even in the short time that our watch has been around. I've seen it in governments establishing dedicated ministries and senior positions in the public service to this area of responsibility. I've seen it in governments and, and with, with individual politicians of all persuasions and police commissioners who joined together and took a stand in our nation's capital. I've seen it with media advancing the public conversation and improving the quality of reporting. And throughout the community, with women and activists like Rosie Batty telling their stories and calling out the ugliness and unacceptability of violence against women in all its forms. Across the country, and especially in this state, decision makers are getting serious about ending violence against women. This is the line we need to hold when it comes to ending men's violence against women. We also need to hold with confidence that such violence is preventable. On behalf of Natasha Stott Despoyer, thank you. Authorised by Vic Health, 15 to 31 Pelham Street, Carlton, Victoria.